I have a big backlist of topics that I never seem to get around to. That's because something new and crazy seems to come along often enough that I just can't get around to all of them. I think this should be addressed though, because not only is there a lot of deceptive material promoting fiber as an essential nutrient, which means you would literally die without it, but it's also an opportunity to talk about how the gut really works, and one of my favorite health supplements, vinegar. Without spoiling too much, vinegar does everything butyrate does except better, and is much easier to produce in the body than butyrate. Unlike fiber, choline really is an essential nutrient, and you will die without it. In fact, this was discovered because many people with serious health problems were dying of liver cancer while being tube-fed, using fake industrialized formulas back in the 90s. You only hear about choline in a negative light today, because the fake food industry that funds the science doesn't want you to eat real foods, but cheap fake foods which have a much higher profit margin. I always wonder why people love talking about their digestion so much, but I've come to realize that most people simply have awful digestion, and that's the reason for their obsession. Thankfully, that is easy to fix, or at least simple. Hi. You mind if I talk to you for just a minute? I just want to say a few words about diarrhea. A lot of wild claims have been made about butyrate's usefulness, not just for gut health, but for your whole body. First off, while butyrate can be made by gut bacteria from fiber, the place it was first found was butter. About 3-4% to of butter is butyric acid, so if you eat 100 grams of butter, you'll get 3-4 to four grams of butyrate. That's a lot of butter, but if you eat butter daily like me, you probably still get a gram or two of butyrate, for whatever that's worth. Since the main benefit of fiber is supposed to be butyrate, how much we get from fiber is something we need to know. Strangely, I never see this mentioned by the endless advocates of fiber, and that is not too surprising once you run the numbers. Keep in mind too, they claim that from 5% to as high as 15% of your dietary calories come from short-chain fatty acids, and that's why butyrate and fiber are just so critical. So let's say 10% of your dietary calories come from butyrate, which would be 200 calories for the typical suggested diet. I've seen abstracts for a study that makes this claim which says they estimated this number somehow, but I'd really mystified us how they came up with such a high number. It's really ridiculously high. The government daily recommended amount of fiber is 21 grams for an adult man and slightly less for a woman. But carbs only have 4 calories per gram, so how does that make it to 200 calories? The maximum possible would be 84 calories. It's actually slightly more because those values are underestimated and carbs actually have 4.5 calories per gram. So let's call it 100 calories in order to give them the full benefit of the doubt. We've already fallen short, but we're still ahead of simply eating a little butter every day, which will yield about 15 to 20 calories worth of butyrate. If everyone actually eats 21 grams of fiber, that is, but few people do. But there's another problem here. Butyric acid is not the only short-chain fatty acid your body produces in its microbiome. In fact, it is one of the least common ones. Only 10% of the short-chain fatty acids produced in your gut are butyric acid. Whoops. So we've gone down from 200 calories in the claim, then down to 100 calories, and now we only have 20% of that, which is a mere 20 calories. That's about the same as simply eating a little butter and cheese every day. However, things quickly go sideways from there. That's only the best case scenario where every single gram of fiber is turned into short-chain fatty acids. In reality, that just doesn't happen. First off, you have to have the right gut bacteria, usually from your parents, or it doesn't happen at all. If you took antibiotics at some point in your life, it's very likely you don't make very much, and you may not make any at all. Even if you do, you're much more likely to produce more propionic acid than butyric acid. Propionic acid has a chemical arrangement that requires carboxylation to be used by the mitochondria for energy, 
and can have unfortunate effects in the brain. This carboxylation process for propionic acid depletes your folate levels, and low folate and high propionic acid in the gut are strongly linked to autism. In fact, if you inject propionate into a mouse, you can induce autism symptoms very easily. Yet this is the genius nutritional advice that's promoted to us, a diet that maximizes propionate. You should also be aware that many baked goods that you buy in the packages also have propionate. So be really careful about buying this stuff in the store because it's going to directly negatively impact your health to have any propionate in the diet. On top of all this, the vast majority of fiber goes in one end and right out the other. Something you have probably seen for yourself in the past. This varies, but it is typical that 90% of fiber is never digested in the body. So now we've gone from 200 calories of butyrate all the way down to 2 calories. I thought I'd been dealt a flush, but I've ended up with another deuce. I'd better say that out loud. I thought I'd been dealt a flush, but I've ended up with another deuce. This quarter gram of butyrate must really do some amazing stuff in the body to have all these effects. It's also only one-tenth what we can get on a carnivore diet simply by having a bit of butter every day. Now clearly fiber is totally insignificant to your total production of butyrate. And if we ate even larger amounts, we would get lots of side effects like bloating and cramping. But is butyrate essential to the body? Do we need it for anything? Do we build our brains out of butyrate like we do from DHA and EPA for example? No, we don't use it for anything except as energy. Now as a short chain fatty acid, butyrate does have some special properties. Butyrate can easily enter the cell membranes and can even enter the mitochondria without being transported in. This allows colonocytes to directly use the energy in butyric acid and also allows insulin resistant and damaged cells to use this energy, which can rescue them and allow for them to work properly again. On top of all that, it also skips some steps in the energy production process, which means less acid is produced compared to other methods and less cleanup is required. A huge part of your body's work is simply getting acid out of the body, especially from your delicate kidneys and lungs. Anything you can do to help this process along will be very positive for your health. That sounds just amazing, doesn't it? And in studies, butyrate has been shown to reduce hunger a great deal in mice. Also amazing until you realize that those studies actually use butyrate from butter. They didn't give them fiber, and in any study where supplemental fiber was given, they didn't get any benefits whatsoever. When you consume even more fiber than what the government recommends, then you're going to run into a lot of bloating and cramping. It's been long known and well understood that stool moisture does not vary regardless of how much fiber or how much water you consume. Fiber does not moisten the stool. And while it's not technically a diagnostic feature of constipation, bloating is a known issue that many people understand is related to excess consumption of fiber. And the reason for this is because it doesn't get digested in the small bowel. Remember, that's the definition of fibre. It's not able to be digested. So it passes down to the large bowel, which has a large bacterial population. And then these bacteria can ferment the fibre, especially the soluble fibre. And they produce something called short-chain fatty acids, which is heralded as being one of the things which it provides health benefits through. But in the process of this, they also produce gases such as hydrogen and given that the volume of the whole gastrointestinal tract is only about one litre it only takes a relatively modest amount of gas production before you start feeling bloated and start having an element of abdominal pain and anybody who lived through the 1980s anybody remember the brand craze you can probably attest to that so what we're left with is that when we look at the best evidence available Fibre worsens constipation, it causes bloating, and does absolutely nothing to moisten our faeces. So how does this relate to low-carbohydrate diets? Well, there's a lot of low-carb foods that are actually high in fibre. So even though 45% of the fibre in the average Australian diet comes from breads and cereals, 
A lot of the food we replace it with when we go on a low carbohydrate diet are also high in fibre. And some of the staples that we love, like berries, cauliflower and almonds, they're in that high fibre group. And if you understand that when they get metabolised in the colon by the bacteria, they can produce gas and bloating, you can understand why if you have a whole bag of nuts, you might feel a degree of discomfort down there. <laughs> so uh, some of you are probably looking at that going, you know what, I did have a big plate of cauliflower mash the other night and I did feel a bit funny overnight. So let's turn our attention to something called the short chain fatty acid. So you'll remember when you, once the fibre is fermented by bacteria, it produces these fatty acids. And they're thought to offer some health benefits. So these bacteria allow the body to salvage energy from an otherwise, otherwise unusable source and use, provided in the form of fats. And estimates vary widely, but it's commonly considered that about 5% of the energy we actually get from our diet when we're eating an average diet actually comes from these short-chain fatty acids which are produced from fibre. And it's said that these short-chain fatty acids nourish the cells that line our colon. They're called colonocytes. And this is thought to help improve conditions like inflammatory bowel disease. <coughs> and while it's true, this is a representation of some of the cells that line the colon, while these cells can use short-chain fatty acids for energy, they only do so by after converting them to ketones first. So, if ketones are produced from short-chain fatty acids and that's beneficial, then isn't it logical that ketones in the circulation from being in nutritional ketosis or in a ketogenic diet would also be beneficial to these cells? They can still get to them. And in fact, the ketones in the circulation are probably even more effective because they're delivered to every colonocyte, not just those in which they're in direct contact with. And this has actually been demonstrated in studies comparing enemas giving short-chain fatty acids and ketones given into the circulation. And it's been shown that the ketones given in the circulation are more effective at treating the inflammation of inflammatory bowel disease, which might mean the short-chain fatty acids aren't so magical after all. And even if they were, fibre isn't the only source of short-chain fatty acids from gut bacteria. This is a graph here and it shows short-chain fatty acid production between a plant-based diet with lots of fibre and an animal-based diet with lots of amino acids. Here in red, you can see that the short-chain fatty acid production is actually higher on the animal-based diet than it is on the plant-based diet. So it would seem there's nothing uniquely beneficial about the production of short-chain fatty acids from fibre at all. More importantly though, before you can even use butyrate for energy, it must be converted into acetic acid, aka vinegar. All those amazing effects I talked about before also apply to vinegar too, but even more so. While your microbiome doesn't produce much butyrate at all, it produces quite a bit of vinegar and this could have a significant impact on your health. In fact, vinegar accounts for about 70% of all short-chain fatty acids produced in the microbiome. So what's the difference, you ask? You still make something from fiber, right? Wrong. You can make some vinegar from fiber, but your body can also use other fuel sources. Bacteria like L. retiri that prefer meat and dairy as fuel sources are the ones that produce the most vinegar. They produce it in order to kill off other pathogenic bacteria that are not meant to be in the gut, such as those that produce propionic acid, which are the same ones that cause acne. Eating excessive carbs, on the other hand, will reduce the numbers of L. retiri and other probiotics and lead to overgrowth of more negative gut bacteria. You can also just take vinegar directly. You will get all the benefits for the gut microbiome and your colonocytes, and also huge benefits for blood pressure, depression, insulin sensitivity, fatty liver, and a huge number of other issues. And in general, you'll just feel a lot better. 
The more vinegar in your gut, whatever the source, the healthier it will become. Positive probiotics generally flourish in the presence of vinegar, while negative gut bacteria are killed off. H. pylori, for example, requires a high pH to thrive, and that is why it will lower the pH of your stomach. Vinegar will help kill these bacteria off and will greatly improve your digestion. I mentioned choline earlier, and not just because it is an essential nutrient, but because it is very good for gut health. Choline increases TMAO in the gut, and while TMAOs are villainized and labeled as a toxic health risk, that's only true when they are produced in the body itself during metabolic syndrome. In the gut, they actually protect the body and even help fight cancer. These are increased by choline consumption in eating grilled meat. If dietary TMAOs were a problem, then grilled fish would be lethal because it has very high quantities of them. But all evidence points to fish being very good for health, whether it's grilled or not. And it also points to dietary TMAOs and choline being helpful in the fight against cancer. Taurine is one of my favorite supplements. The list of good things it does in the body is just endless, but one of the biggest ways it's helpful is with gut health. As an osmolite that helps control the flow of fluids, taurine is crucial for the junctions of your gut to keep out unwanted infiltrators from entering the bloodstream. It also helps fight colon cancer and does much more for your digestion. Glycine is another favorite. It's also helpful for the gut. Your gut is made of collagen and glycine is the limiting factor for collagen production. Even consuming collagen or gelatin itself will do much less for the generation of collagen than taking the same amount of glycine. It is also much easier to get down than collagen or gelatin powder and cheaper to boot. On top of all that, it's not contaminated with glyphosate as most collagen is today, even if it's organic. Does all this mean that fiber is bad? Can fiber kill you? In fact, fiber kills thousands of people every year. If you take a fiber supplement and don't take enough water with it, this can lead to intestinal blockage and this leads to a surprising number of deaths every single year. You can also get a blockage from eating salad or fibrous veggies if the fiber tangles up into a ball, especially if you have a hernia. That's what happened to me, though it's hard to tell if the hernia caused the blockage or vice versa. This led to me going on a liquid diet for a while and it was a giant nightmare. But I won't go into the whole long story right now. Does fiber help you go to the bathroom though? Now that depends. If you eat a lot of lean meat, which is the only kind of meat the authorities promote, if any, it might help push it through as it were. On the other hand, when you have enough fat in the diet and you don't eat a low fat diet like most people today, you just don't have this problem. I made a video about how fat in the diet is anabolic and carbs are catabolic. But in general, a low-fat, high-carb diet is simply awful for your health on every level. In the Women's Health Initiative study, switching the unhealthy to a low-fat diet to attempt to heal them caused a large spike in mortality. So an independent investigator uncovered the original study data in a basement and went through a rigorous process of analysing the data. And when they analysed it, they actually found that the mortality rate for the group that was given the vegetable and seed oil actually increased by 62%. This is a large-scale, randomised controlled trial over a number of years. And yet the data wasn't originally published. It was, you know, decades later when it was actually published. And if you have a look here now, if you come and have a look here, we can see... That this is the intervention group. This is the group that was given the oil. This is the control group that still had their regular intake of saturated fat. And this is the death rate along the side. So the higher this line, then the worse the outcome. And you can clearly see that there's more people dying in the vegetable oil group than they were in the saturated fat consuming group. Now this kind of data has basically been buried, and it's not the only one. We have the Minnesota coronary experiment, which ran between 1968 and 1973. Over 9,000 subjects, males and females, 
and it was very similar. They, you know, gave some people vegetable oils and other ones that didn't. And the results weren't published after the study completed for 16 years. And even then, they didn't publish the data on mortality. And when they actually asked one of the original investigators before he died why they didn't publish the data, he said, and I quote, it was because they found the results disappointing. So this is hard evidence that was basically hidden from the public for decades. And it's finally been published in 2016 in the British Medical Journal, a very reputable journal. But don't think for one second that this kind of, I guess, misrepresentation or hiding of results is uh, confined only to previous eras. We still have it in the modern era. You may have heard of the Women's Health Initiative study. This here cost over 700 million US dollars. They followed 48,000 females for about eight years. This was a big, massive study. And yet, when we look at the results when it was published, if we have a look at the conclusions, no statistically significant findings. If we flip through to the results tables, we don't find any statistically significant findings at all. But it's only when we go to page 661 of this study, in one sentence of obscure text, which I've highlighted here, do we get the truth. This is the only statistically significant finding in this study. And what that means is that when we do a study, we can sometimes get findings that are likely to be due to chance. So we have to do mathematical calculations to work out what that probability is. So if we get a finding that's called statistically significant, then we say this finding is not due to by chance, it's what we call a real finding. And this study only had one of those findings. And that was that females with a history of heart disease, if they went on a low-fat diet, their chance of complications of things like heart attacks was increased by 26%. That was the only significant finding of this study. And it was basically buried on page 661 of this journal. And this is long-term experimental data, the best form of science we have, and it proved the diet promoted by the authorities is the worst possible diet for health. And yet that's still what they promote. Another thing I see many people say is that they're lactose intolerant and milk disrupts their gut. In reality, people with no genes for lactose digestion can drink a reasonable amount of milk without problems. And if you do have these kinds of issues, it is often a sign your gut is in awful shape. If you drink fat-free milk, then it can have a harmful effect on your digestion due to the sugar and casein. But the fat in whole milk will greatly aid in regularity and will ameliorate these issues. I suspect the real issue for many of these people is that they are constipated, then they take some milk and suddenly things get moving again, and they think that this is a bad thing. What's bad is that you have pounds of waste in your body from constipation, not that your body finally managed to get rid of some of it. Ironically, some will claim that taking a large amount of fiber will also make you go more often, and that that's a good thing. That may be true, but I would rather simply put some more fat in my diet and never be constipated and full of pounds of waste in the first place. Wheat and sugar are the biggest criminals when it comes to gut health. Bad bacteria will overgrow your gut when you ingest them. These bacteria don't want to be expelled and they are responsible for clogging you up. They can even exert influence over the brain and make you crave carbs in the diet. There's a fungus affecting ants called cordyceps which turns them into zombies and then they do nothing but try and spread the virus more. Well, there's also bacteria that turn humans into carb zombies. Carb zombies can get very angry when you try to suggest moderating their carb intake, but it's really just the gut pathogens talking. Many of the probiotic bacteria like L. Ruturi love whole milk though. These bacteria not only feed on the proteins, but use the fat to make biocides that kill off the negative bacteria, which they then eat. Yogurt making bacteria also produce vinegar, which kills off bad bacteria and has amazing health effects in your whole body. This includes the bacteria that cause acne, which causes even worse issues inside the body than outside the body, including neuroinflammation and even death in the form of sepsis. 
You can also get vinegar from fermented foods and you will get all the benefits of vinegar plus the benefits of the probiotics as well. Or you can just drink a bit of the juice, but don't overdo it, it's pretty salty. Probiotics are aerobic and tend to thrive in an acidic environment. While these conditions kill off the bad guys like C. acnes and Firmicutes, pathogenic microbes tend to thrive in an anaerobic low acidity environment. This is an unfortunate consequence of a high carb diet. Eating a certain way has been promoted so hard using so much money that people take it for granted as correct. But in reality it is very unnatural to have all these strange foods on the plate constantly. I remember as a kid seeing romaine lettuce in the store for the first time and being mystified as to what it was. And before that all they ever had was iceberg lettuce. And the further back in time we go the fewer options we had and the more animal products we consumed. We also didn't always have food around, even in relatively modern times. We simply aren't designed to constantly eat, and when we do this is terrible for our gut microbiome. When we fast, the bad guys die out, but the good guys, which are probiotic, will survive by eating the bad guys. Fasting also boosts our immune system, which is what keeps these bugs from killing us in our sleep every night. So don't just blindly do whatever the TV suggests. Look at the facts and decide for yourself what's right for you. In today's society, this just might save your life. Okay. Here's the casket. Climb in, buddy. Will I get rescued or something? You ask a hell of a lot of questions. <laughs> how long will I be in here? Oh, not long. Well, how long exactly? I can't clarify that till everyone's back from lunch.